All right, so those are just a couple of announcements. And now we are going to go ahead and jump right in to introducing you to our special guest, um, Bikas Madhav uh, Nagarajan is currently pursuing a master's in environmental public policy from the Georgia Institute of Technology. Um, he's in his first year. He has been a naturalist for over 15 years and is a reviewer for citizen science platforms such as eBird, India, and Butterflies of India. He has published several natural history articles, mostly on butterflies. Along with others, he has compiled the first comprehensive checklist of the butterflies of Chennai. He has led several surveys and expeditions to the Western Ghats and Western Himalayas and has traveled to 16 states in India. He was the recipient of the Young Naturalist Award in 2014 and is also an active campaigner on local environmental issues. And so, because we are so thrilled and honored to have you joining us today and sharing all about your adventures in the wonderful birds of India. Um, and so I'm gonna go ahead and pass it over to you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for having me here. So I'm going to try and share my screen now. And there we go. So can you see my screen? Yes, you're perfect. Oh, cool. We're good. So hi guys, and I'll be talking today about my experiences with uh, bird watching in India. So I started bird watching when I was my first grade. So that was quite some time back because now I'm like 22. So that was like when I was, I think, six years old. So I've done a lot of traveling over the years and I don't have any favorite place per se to talk about. So I thought, well, to give a whole rounded view of India, I'm going to try and target the habitats we have in India and talk to you about the birds you see in these different habitats and where exactly these habitats in India are. So what are these habitats we're going to visit today? So we'll start with, the, with urban India because we are known for our large population, which doesn't only have a lot of humans, but also has a lot of treasured wildlife, including birds. Then we'll go slowly towards grasslands, scrublands, rivers, wetlands, mangroves, coastal ecosystems, and then a variety of forests. So I have classified them as lowland forests, which are pretty common in India and higher elevation forests, which I've subdivided as they as higher elevation forests differ from different regions in India. Unlike lowland forests, which predominantly have pretty much the same species of birds, that's not the case in higher elevation uh, um, uh, forests in India. So I have classified it in that aspect. So let's get to it, shall we? So starting with cities and urban India. So India ha has a lot of people and for all that people, we need to have a lot of infrastructure. But even though that there's a lot of infrastructure and concrete jungle in India, we somehow have space for having a lot of animals because it's kind of in our culture to have a lot of trees around us and have, you know, small gardens and stuff like that. So community gardens and having avenue trees has helped maintain and stabilize, you know, a, a, a significant amount of diversity. So when it comes to birds, we pretty much see the same species of birds in most Indian cities. However, there are like small changes if you're in the north part of India or in the southern part of India. So I grew up in a city called Chennai, which is in the southern part of India. So my presentation might be a little biased towards the south, but uh, don't worry, there will be a lot of birds from North India, which I have also featured in my PowerPoint. So to give you an idea of what these birds coexist with. So I come from a city in Chennai and it isn't really one of the, it is one of the largest cities, but it isn't like the largest city in India. And it has a population greater than the population of NYC. So that will tell you how many people there are uh, which these birds share with but they still do a good job. So these are some of the birds we find commonly throughout India and in most of our uh, cities. So out, out of these birds, the, the, the one with the best story is the Indian peacock because it's the national bird of India. And it's, it's a beautiful bird. <laughs> like it has a beautiful voice and you can see it pretty much in any Indian city 
because it has a lot of uh, religious significance in India. So they like uh, having birds of religious significance around them. And they're also very useful ecologically because we have a large snake, po snake population in India and they help stabilize the uh, snake uh, population basically in urban India. So that's, that's of some ecological use that they have. Apart from that, you have species like the barn owl, which help uh, control rodent population. So that's also something which is well looked up, well seen in India. So when people see owls, they're always excited. Apart from that, the other birds which I have featured are, are like the, uh, the blue rock pigeon, which is something I'm pretty sure you all are familiar with. It's the same pigeon which we get in America, which we have there. It's one of the most cosmopolitan species of birds in the world. So yeah, it's there in India too. The yellow bill babbler is a bird which is normally restricted to South India, but in North India, we get a species called the jungle babbler in the cities. So coming to more open spaces. So we're, we're from the city, we're going to start moving towards more open grounds. And in India, we have a lot of these kind of open places. So towards the Southern part and even a lot of North India, these open spaces generally have a lot of dry grasslands. But when we go to the more wetter parts of India, like the Northeast, we have basically wet grasslands which form. And both of these ecosystems have, have different types of animals. I unfortunately have not had the privilege of having a lot of time in wet grasslands because that's in uh, states like Assam and Manipur, which I haven't had the chance to survey that much. So I'm gonna show you birds I've seen in dry grasslands today. Birds of dry grassland are typically more duller as they need to uh, camouflage well with the background. So you'll have, and they'll, they're generally smaller birds because they wanna hide within the grass. And you, you have birds like the barred button quail, which you might think a quail is something which is pretty easy for you to find. You can have, so there, I have this nice story I have. Near my college, there's this nice open space. And in that open space, there is this family of around 10 of these birds. And I didn't see them for almost three and a half years I studied there. <laughs> and it was only in the last year when I was walking one day pretty late after class, I saw this like, train like action suddenly jotting down. And then I realized, oh my God, these are quails and they've been here all this while. So these are birds which can pretty much be there in the environment and you will not have any idea of them. Most of these birds are resident, but there are migratory species like the pale harrier and the Hume's white throat, which do migrate between uh, uh, other parts of the world towards India. For instance, the, and another bird, the Isabellian strikes. For instance, the Isabellian strike, come from some places of Central Asia and sometimes Middle East towards India. So a little more into drier area, we have scrubland and a lot of the rain shadow parts of hills, that's the area where rainfall is a little lower, they tend to have these kind of scrubland habitats and generally scrubland habitats have very, very thorny uh, plants. So it is a little difficult surveying in these kinds of habitat. And there are a lot of risks involved when we do these kind of habitats in India, because these kind of places generally have a lot of quarries and these quarries are used for taking minerals, but at the same time, they tend to not be very socially safe places. So generally uh, I do not advise people to go to scrublands with alone. So generally when we go to scrubland, it's always a pre-planned trip and we all are completely properly geared and it's like 10 of us all ready to go and in case something goes wrong, fight it. So scrubland birds are also pretty much the same. They're all tough, rough and tough birds. So because they're, they, they basically live among thorns. That's basically the habit that. And scrublands, you get species like the white-eyed buzzard, the silky malkoha, jungle prinia, laughing dove, white broad bulbul, the bayback shrike and the gray-headed starling. Of these birds, uh, except for the white broad bulbul, majority of them can be seen throughout the country. The white broad bulbul is a species which is endemic to South India. So you don't find it anywhere else but peninsular India. 
Another ecosystem which I feel generally people do not pay a lot of attention to are river line ecosystems. And in India, uh, the northern rivers are snow fed. So they're much more larger and they have much more voluminous water and they are perennial rivers. Whereas the rivers in the south, they are rain fed. They are also perennial. I wouldn't call them seasonal because we have a lot of rain. So they are not, not perennial, but at the same time, they're not as large as, you know, many of the North Indian rivers. So these riverine ecosystems change based on where you are geographically put in India. So in the South, because of a lot of agriculture and especially uh, the, the type of agriculture we have in India, we tend to see a lot of paddy fields next to the South Indian rivers. And that gives a different kind of diversity like weaver birds and munias, for example. Whereas the North Indian uh, rivers, they generally have a lot of millets and wheat mainly. So that ecosystem tends to have a different kind of bird activity. And this picture is actually from the Northeast, which is, uh, and this is from a place called Arunachal Pradesh. So that's a very, very beautiful state in India. I feel every person who plans a trip to India should definitely go to the state. So the state of Arunachal Pradesh is situated in the extreme east of India. And this place is beautiful. And its rivers are completely different from the rest of the country. So you'll have pebbles. It, it's beautiful and scenic, these long sandbanks where you can just sit and watch, you know, birds fly, river dolphins. It's a very, very beautiful experience. So what kind of birds do we see in this? So we get a lot of birds in, throughout India's river. So I've tried to make, I've tried to adjust it and put a few South Indian and North Indian species. So we get species like the Eastern yellow wagtail, which are more of like Northeastern and small Pratt and Cole, which is basically seen throughout the country in any river line ecosystem. And as the name suggests, the river turn. So the Indian river turn is now slowly having a population decline. So we are a little concerned about that species but its majority of its habitat is basically on these riverline ecosystems where there will be these small islands which are formed on the rivers and especially along river banks, these small jutting out uh, cutting edge areas. So these areas with nice grass pastures, pastures help breeding, uh, help in the breeding of these birds. Then I think this is one bird you all would have recognized, the osprey. So, this, it's the, this, I think, the population which we get in India, if I'm right, comes from uh, Europe. But we have started seeing that there's some amount of local movement in ospreys. And there is a reason to believe that there are, could be certain individuals which tend to stay back now in India. So who knows, maybe 20 years down the line, we might find that we might start having a small resident population of ospreys in India and they might stop migrating. Wetlands. So wetlands are one of the most important ecosystems according to me in India because they are amazing flood management. So they are natural flood management systems. So they help, they have helped a lot, of, in, a lot of times in India without people knowing. So they help in that. They also very good effluent treatment uh, plants. So species like typha, they tend to absorb a lot of uh, heavy metals, phosphates, and nitrous, nitrous uh, material in, in wastewater, which comes inside. So I would say that wetlands are not only an ecological tool, but they're also an important environment tool for us. And they host a variety of uh, birds. Uh, this slide is, does not do justice to the, to the biodiversity of a wetland. These are some of the most iconic species you get in wetlands of which I, I really love talking about this bird, the ruddy breasted crake. So this picture took me almost 10 years to, I, it took me 10 years to take this picture because this bird would just not sit. <laughs> it's a very, very shy bird. And I have seen this bird since 2000 and I think 2008 is the first time I saw this bird in a small wetland in my city. And all my sightings after that have just been dashes of the bird. 
it's a they're very shy bird i'm pretty sure all of you would have also had similar you know uh interactions with crakes and rails they're very very shy birds so that doesn't change wherever you go in the world apparently so they're still as shy as they are in america <laughs> so it goes with the slaty breasted rail that's also an equally shy bird but not as bad as the ruddy breasted crake the ruddy breasted crake is a much more shyer bird Wetlands also host a lot of uh, migratory birds, such as the citrine wagtail and the gray-headed lapwing. So these birds fly, I'm not very sure where the citrine wagtail comes from. I, I believe it's from Mongolia, I'm not very sure. Whereas the gray-headed lapwing also comes from uh, Southeast Asia and Australia, that belt. Mangroves. So mangrove ecosystems are a very, very un, untouched uh, treasure. These are also amazing uh, natural disaster mitigants. So they help stop the impact of tidal waves. We have, we actually had a lot of mangroves in India, but unfortunately due to a lot of uh, ill management over the last years, we've lost a lot of our mangrove growth. So, East coast of India used to be a huge continuous mangrove stretch. There were huge continuous mangrove stretches which were not protected, which sadly now have been lost over the years. But there are still some very, very important mangrove uh, pastures in India. So one of the most important places is the Sundarbans, which is the largest mangrove uh, set up in Asia, and I believe the world. And we have other larger ones, like uh, large ones like Pichavaram and Bitterkanika along the East coast. The west coast of India has this one, they, they have pockets of mangroves, but not as prominent as the eastern coast. I think one of the most uh, prominent ones on the western coast would be the one in Goa. There's this river called the Zuari River. So there, it's a nice, that's a nice place where you could try, you know, spending some time with mangrove forests. And the most iconic birds of a mangrove forest are kingfishers. In, for example, the Sundarbans, which I was talking to earlier, that has, I think, if I'm right, eight species of kingfishers. So you have a wide variety of kingfishers in these habitats. Apart from kingfishers, these mangrove habitats tend to also have other kinds of uh, tropical dry evergreen forests. So these, this, this beautiful knitting of having these trees which are going to be green throughout along with these mangrove protection barriers results in this completely perennially green setup along of course, which is very, very beautiful and scenic to the eye, and also gets a lot of birds like this. So of these birds, the brown wing kingfisher is a very interesting species. You will only see this bird in um, well, well, I mean, I mean, well, I mean, very, very old mangrove setups. So, so far in, in the mainland of India, it's only been seen reliably from two places, the Sundarbans and Pichakanika nowhere else because it requires really really good solid mangrove forests. Another interesting bird is the Ajiran star which is seen in other habitats like wetlands and riverline ecosystems at times but it prefers mangroves. A habitat which I love visiting honestly is the beach with, because you know you can go you can relax with your friends you can see other animals you can see shells you can see jellyfish, but you can also see a lot of birds. So the problem in India is though, our beaches are not well maintained because there is a lot of pollution which is pushed into the sea, which gets coughed up back onto the shore. So it's not just on-site on pollution. It's a lot of pollution which is thrown through rivers, which comes back to us. But apart from that, we are not really great at maintaining our beaches. There is a movement to start cleaning these beaches and it's really good that that's picking up but uh till then birds don't really care that much <laughs> because they have just started living with the trash so in this you can see that even though the guard some of the garbage pieces are as large as the plover here the plovers are still pretty much there because they can't they have nowhere else to go so this is a flock of lesser sand plovers in this beach called the Adair beach in oh, sorry Besanagar beach in Chennai So beaches have these beautiful, uh, it's, it's like this, what do I say? 
an ecotone where two ecosystems meet. You have the coastal side of things like the ocean and you have the river side of things, which is like from the in inland part. So these two ecotones meet. So this region that has a lot of diversity. So the most characteristic species are gulls and terns. And we also have a lot of uh, raptor birds, like, such as the Brahmini kite, which uh, primarily feed on fish. So most of the birds you find here would be fish, fish eating birds. Some of them like waders, like the curlew and oyster catcher might feed on oysters or other uh, worms, which we find on the beach. Beach is also well known for having small and large waders. So one of the most prominent small waders we get in India is the Pacific Golden Plover, which is pretty much found throughout the country. And even when there are no coastal parts in the country, it's, it's started to now uh, come inside large rivers. So where there are good grasslands, good amount of grasslands, it, they like uh, congregating there now. But it's mainly a coastal species where I guess uh, I counted almost a thousand of them last year in this one spot, uh, in just one spot. So they are very, very common. Among the large waders, this is one of my favorite, the lesser flamingo. So the lesser flamingo is a species which is slightly rarer in the south, but much more common in the north of India. So this species tends to only uh, come along, I would say, uh, I would say brackish water ecosystems maybe, because it does now and then come inside coastal ecosystems, but uh, sorry, inland ecosystems such as wetlands, but it prim primarily is a brackish water species. And as a lot of you might, must be aware, the pink color comes from the, from its diet. So it's, it's one of, it's, I, I love watching flamingos, especially, you know, a bunch of them taking off. There's this place, uh, the Western part of India called the Ran of Kutch. So there you get like uh, uh, hundreds of thousands of these flamingos and it's so beautiful seeing all of them take off. So coming from a more open, we've been in a very open area all this while to more closed setups with, uh, sorry, canopy setups, such as uh, forests. So lowland forests. So this is a very loosely defined word here. So what I've tried to classify forests are basically forests which are at zero meters sea level and forests which are above zero meters sea level as lowland and highland. Generally in India, the lowland forests are pretty much the same. They, there isn't a large difference in the uh, species which we see. However, the forests do change slightly. So the forests we get in the southern parts of India, they generally have a lot of tropical dry evergreen forests. So these, since they are evergreen, they are normally green throughout the year. Whereas some parts of North India, have a deciduous forest. So there is a point where the trees shed their leaves. But apart from that, the bird composition is pretty much the same. We get a lot of these pretty birds in lowland forests, of which the rose finch is my favorite. It comes uh, especially in winter. And it's a very beautiful bird. It has this beautiful pink color, which uh, actually confused me the first time. Because when I came to America, uh, there's this bird called the purple finch. So, which honestly was not that purple for me. <laughs> so I thought that was a rose finch for a long time and uh, I got very confused. And then I learned, okay, that's a purple finch. So this is very, very similar to a purple finch. And there are a lot of woodpeckers we get in these kind of lowland setups. Like well, the most common or rather not common, I would say the most iconic is the streak-throated woodpecker. But it, it has this very beautiful red head. We have other species of birds, such as the forest wagtail, Indian paradise flycatcher, and fantails, which are also found in more of, I would say, thicker forests, because they like dense canopy. And forest wagtail is a very interesting bird. So it's a bird which is well documented in South India. But uh, up until recently, it was always thought to be a passage migrant for most of the parts of like, no, the parts of India which are in lowland areas, I would say. It was normally seen, thought to be a, more of a high elevation winter migrant. 
So I recently authored a paper with a few other bird watchers. And we found that, you know, the forest racket actually is not just a passage migrant. It's a proper migrant now to a proper winter migrant to most of Southern India, especially to the city I, I live in, in Chennai. So it's no longer a passage migrant. It is considered as a full winter species now. And another interesting thing about this is, uh, in this slide is the crested serpent eagle. So as the name suggests, it feeds primarily on snakes. In fact, I, I will go as far as to say, I haven't seen it eat anything else. I've seen it normally eat, be it cobras, uh, green vine snakes sometimes, and rat snakes. I've seen it, I've mainly seen it with rat snakes. Uh, it's a pretty fearless bird. So coming to peninsular hills. So this is where I'm splitting high elevation forests into three places. So I'm spending a South India, Northern India, and Northeast India. So in South India, I couldn't really call it South Indian hills because technically some of these hills do range slightly into Central India. So I thought the fairest way was to call them peninsular hills. There are two main hills we get in this zone. One is the Eastern Guards and the Western Guards. So the Eastern Guards, are slightly shorter, smaller hills and get not as much as rain as the Western Guards. Western Guards are slightly taller hills and they have much more diversity. There's more endemism, which is prominent in West, the Western Guards than the Eastern Guards. So this is a picture in the Eastern Guards. I, I just wanted to show you guys the difference between the two. So this is how a typical Eastern Guard forest would be. It's green, it is, it's rich in diversity. Western Guards is another whole new, another plane. You have these beautiful pockets of forest which will be formed. And you can see, right, there's these, there's grassland and you have pockets of forests. So this comes in really, really high elevation parts of the Western Guards. Otherwise, in the slightly lower parts of the Western Guards, you just have continuous evergreen forests. So like I said, in the higher elevations, you have these grassland patches with pockets of forests. So this kind of a habitat is generally referred to as a sholai or a shola forest. So the species we generally associate with that habitat are the great Indian hobble, which is a very, very big bird. The black eagle, another really, really big bird. Negri flycatcher, Negri pipit, Palni laughing thrush, Malabar trogan, Weller front and attach, crimson sunbird and gray jungle fowl. So as I said, the Western Guards has a lot of endemism uh, associated with it. So the Negri flycatcher, the Negri pipit, the Palni laughing thrush, and the crimson uh, back sunbird, my, my bad, crimson back sunbird, these are all endemic to the Western Guards. And in fact, the Negri flycatcher and the Negri pipit are endemic to the southern part of the Western Guards. So they're not even seen the entire Western Guards. So they are very, so some of these birds are very, very picky. The Western Himalayas. So the Western Himalayas are, they're they are a tough place to live in for both people and birds. It gets bitterly cold. This, this is basically when, what you associate with like, when people talk about the Himala Himalaya, Himalayas, this is basically what you associate with. It's dry, cold, has a lot of snow. I generally have surveyed just before or after a big snow. I haven't been there during this freeze because it's very, very cold. And I come from a city which has temperatures which are always 82 degrees Fahrenheit. So I am not used to that much of cold. So I generally survey just before the snow and after the snow. And during the freeze, you it is very, very difficult to survey birds or any kind of wildlife because it's very difficult to cook. You do not get electric power in a lot of these higher elevation places. It is difficult. There is not a lot of infrastructure, but it's slowly getting more accessible over the years. So the birds which you typically find in this kind of habitat, these are the most common species I've dealt with are the Himalayan bulbul, the ultramarine flycatcher, the turtle dove, long-tailed minivet. Such a pretty bird, right? The long-tailed minivet. There are a lot of minivets in the Western Himalayas and this in this belt. We have a scarlet minivet and a short minivet, which also look very similar. So we actually have to tell 
we tell them apart by the wing structure and how much uh, redness there is on the wing patch. That's the best identification key for that. Then you have speed, colorful birds like the great barbet and the green back tip. And finally, uh, oh, before that, this is a beautiful uh, experience I had in the Western Himalayas. So I'm not sure how many of you would have heard of this bird. This is called the bearded vulture or the lamagire. It's a bird which is found pretty much in all, in, uh, I think, in Europe, if I'm right, Africa too, and in Asia all mountainous regions in this zone basically and it basically only feeds on bone marrow and it's known to basically carry uh, large chunks of bone like of it generally likes you know bones like tibia which have a lot of bone marrow in it and it picks it up to a real height flies with it to a big height and then drops it from there and comes crashing on the earth and when it splinters, eats the bone marrow from that. So this is an odd individual which decided to get a little lazy and basically took the bone and swallowed it whole. So you can see how strong its stomach acid should be to completely digest bone. So that was something really impressive here. And last but definitely not the only the habitat left in India because like I said this is a different kind of classification I tried. This is the eastern Himalayas and the eastern Himalayas are basically what I'm referring to are north northeastern hills of India. There are seven beautiful beautiful hill uh, states in India which have a lot of uh, biodiversity. Visiting them is a little difficult because there is a little uh, what do I say, social issues which do happen in that area. There's a lot of violence which does come now and then in that region. But uh, some, some of these states are safe to visit, such as Assam and Arunachal Pradesh and Meghalaya, for instance. They are pretty safe to uh, visit. I have visited those states. So this is from uh, basically Arunachal Pradesh. In the Eastern Himalayas, there's... I, I cannot do justice to the Eastern Himalayas. There are so many species of birds. For example, if I am right, there's this one bird sanctuary in Arunachal Pradesh called the uh, Mishmi Wildlife Sanctuary. So that area has uh, close to like 500 species of birds, which is, <laughs> which is a huge number of birds. So the Eastern Himalayas, uh, this is just a small snapshot into the species you find there. You get species like the green-tailed sunbird, such a colorful bird. It has almost all the prominent colors of a rainbow on it. Darker shades, but almost all the colors are there on it. The golden breasted fulvata, black throated parrot bull, striped yuhina, lesser cuckoo, golden throated barber, and blitz leaf warbler. Northeast, generally, or the Eastern Himalayas, generally has a lot of birds which we do share with Southeast Asia. So for folks who want to get like, uh, taste of Southeast Asia too, you should definitely try a trip when you're going to India to go to Northeast too, because you get some of the species we get in Thailand here. Not all, but just a small, you know, sampler of what you get in the Eastern, more East. So yeah, I will now open the floor to questions and this is how you can reach me up, yeah. Here we go, <laughs> because I have been sitting over here with my jaw on the floor. Um, your passion and joy around the birds that you've seen and exploring the habitats in which they live is so palpable. Um, and it's such a joy to be able to witness. Thank you so much for sharing all of that with us. I have to ask first, did you take all those pictures? Yes, all those are my pictures. Yes. Wow. <laughs> wow. Because took all of those pictures, for those of you who, who may have missed that. Um, and it's so wonderful to see just how thorough, <laughs> how thorough your exploration and surveys have been, that you've been able to capture so many incredible shots of so many different species. And I know this is only like a subset, I'm sure, of all that you've seen, um, but it's been wonderful to be able to, to, to witness that. Um, so question that I have, and again, if you have any questions for Vikas, uh, you can put your question into the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen and I will relay them to him. 
um, so that we could uh, get those get those answered. Um, but one of, well, I don't even know if it's a question, but it was, it's been very cool to kind of see, I think most of these birds, this is the first time that I'm seeing and hearing of them, and to see what could possibly be some convergent evolution between some of the birds that are um, in the different parts of India that you've described here and the ones that we have, um, some of the ones we have here in, in Georgia, even in, in North America. Um, and there was one in particular that I wrote down, the gray-headed swamp hen. Yeah. Um, here yeah. in Georgia, we've got moor hens or gallinules, and yeah. it reminded me so much of the purple gallinule, which is a very, like, secretive, hard to, to capture, hard to find bird. They love to hide more than the other birds that are in the wetland areas. And so it was just so cool um, to, to see some of the similarities. Um, so Dottie asks, if you could visit only one part of India, where would you recommend most for bird diversity? For bird diversity, I would say the Northeast. It's amazing. Not, nowhere in India comes close to that. <laughs> That's incredible. Is that the is that the area that you were just talking about? As yeah, far yeah, as like yeah, yeah. Yep. exactly, yeah, the last one, especially the state of Arunachal Pradesh. So that has a lot of birds, and the only problem is there was a lot of hunting which was happening there. So birds are a little shy. But you will see a lot of them. You might not be able to take pictures, but you will see a lot of birds and you, you'll go deaf. There are so many calls. You'll not know where to turn your head because you'll have so many calls. You, it's a different experience. It's a completely different experience. Oh my God. I have goosebumps. I have goosebumps. <laughs> um, <laughs> that's incredible. Um, one question that we have is um, of all the, the ecosystems that you visited, what has been the most exciting ex field experience that you've had surveying birds? For me, it is the higher elevations of the south, the mm -hmm. Western Ghats especially. Because I basically, I would say I spent all my vacations growing up in the Western Ghats. So it was a lot of fun. I go to like places like Nagarhole, Korekanal, Uti, Vainard. They are beautiful, beautiful places. The Parani Hills, Niagri Hills. So since I spent a lot of time there, I, I'm, that's very, very close to my heart. So I would say that's where I learned a lot of stuff. And okay. there, yeah, a lot of things you learn when you're there, like generally how to be safe, because there are a lot of mammals you share this with, like elephants, tigers, leopards. So you can't just walk where you want to walk. So you, you kind of also learn that. And there are things which are not threatening, but annoying, like ticks and leeches. So it's, it's a good mix of how to become a naturalist. That's a really nice place where I, I think I would say I, my naturalist side grew a lot. In. Wow, that's incredible. And along with that question, what has been your most exciting or memorable field experience? I would say the llama gyre, which I just showed, because generally people always associate the bird picking up the bone and then going at that height and then dropping it. And this bird was like, no, that's too much effort. I'm just gonna swallow the whole <laughs> bone. <laughs> And it just did it so beautifully in like a minute. It, it didn't even flinch. It took the bone. I was looking at it. And then it just completely swallowed it whole. Oh my God. When I saw that picture of that bird, I've heard of that bird. Of course, I've seen it on, on nature documentaries. I'm just like, I cannot imagine witnessing that in real life. Uh, because so I just, I am fully and entirely jealous um, of the experiences that you've been able to have looking at birds. Um, another question that we have is, what is your favorite bird that you've seen so far um, in the U.S.? And just to preface, in case anyone missed it at the beginning, um, Vikas is a student at Georgia Tech, and he's in his first year of grad school, and so he just moved to Atlanta um, in this school year. Um, and so, yes, in the short time that you've been here, do you have a favorite bird so far? Well, I would say the goldfinch. It's such a pretty bird. Nice, bright yellow. That's, That's nice. good. And the bald eagle. I like both. I like the bald eagle too. You like this. Well, if you have not seen the goldfinches in spring, you are in for an even brighter yellow. Oh, I haven't. Um, so yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> You've got some, yeah, some good yellow coming up in the next couple of months with the goldfinches. Um, James wanted to say, because it was wonderful to see you again, thanks again for treating me to a day of birding in Chennai. Um, James wanted to share that in, in the chat. Um, all right. Well, because uh, this has been absolutely incredible. Um, as I mentioned, this is uh, Vikas's first calendar year in the Atlanta area, and he has not had a chance to go exploring in a lot of birding locations yet. 
And so I would love it if you, oh, you can see uh, his contact information on the screen. If you have birding locations that you really, really like, I would encourage you to send them to Vika so he can explore some of the er local areas um, and learn more about some of the places he can find cool birds. And we'll, of course, myself included, be taking Vikas out on adventures to go exploring <laughs> Atlantis bird species. And we're very excited to have that. Um, so yes, we are thrilled to be able to host you on Georgia Audubon trips in the very near future Vikas and learn so much from you. Um, this presentation has been absolutely mind blowing. Thank absolutely you. mind blowing. And I cannot say it enough. Um, so we'll be, re we've recorded this video, um, this presentation and we'll be sharing it with all of our uh, constituents and the folks who registered who weren't able to join us so that people can continue to learn what you have shared um, this afternoon. Is there anything that you wanted to share before we, we close out for our uh, monthly meeting? Well, happy birding. That's it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> absolutely, absolutely happy birding. Well, because thank you so much and thank you all so much for joining us and for tuning in. And we look forward to seeing you at our upcoming events for Georgia Audubon. And uh, as Vikas shared, happy writing to you all. All right. Thank you, everyone. Bye, Vikas. Bye. Bye. Bye.